All right, so so hi everyone, um, welcome welcome again. It's it's great to meet everyone and to kind of have a, a melding of of several different communities here tonight. Um, so there's three of us from this project present this evening. Um, you're going to hear um, you're, you're going to hear mostly from Jing Wang and myself, um, but Morgan is also here, um, and so we we may call on her and she can certainly help us with some of the Q and A. Um, that screen share was fine. Um, it's fine. Yep. 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 That works well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So tonight we're going to talk about applying OpenStreetMap to support place-based mapping. Again, um, Jing, Morgan, myself, um, Jing and I are at North Carolina State. We're both with the Parks and Rec and Tourism Management Department, as well as our Center for Geospatial Analytics. And Morgan is with Health and Human Performance at the College of Charleston. Um, next slide, please. So what brought the three of us together and, and, and how we kind of began arriving at OpenStreetMap is, um, is our background and interest in physical activity and play. And so play is such a critical part of everyone's life, uh, all of us, uh, but especially for children, for, develop, for building development, for, for building social skills, for building physical skills. Um, and so play is a critical part of childhood. Uh, however, access, so proximity and presence of play spaces differs across the U.S., um, as well as the quality of those play spaces differ across the U.S. Um, next slide. So this is a photo. You can see uh, Morgan there in the background. She's completing... Um, yeah, thanks. She's completing one of our, our quality forms. This, um, this is, a, this is uh, a public playground uh, associated with public housing in Aurora, Colorado, one of the spaces you'll, you'll see here through these slides. Um, and so this is one of the publicly available play spaces that were helped uh, map through OpenStreetMap as well as through our work with Kaboom. Um, so what was driving our project with Kaboom? Kaboom is a national uh, nonprofit that helps, uh, whose goal is to end play space inequity. Uh, and they do a lot of this through building new play spaces and new playgrounds. And they have a two-year project with the Colorado Health Foundation to first understand access and quality to play spaces in Colorado, and then to develop a dashboard to share back with the Colorado Health Foundation and these three communities. And so the Colorado Health Foundation funded Kaboom for this work and then Kaboom reached out um, to, to myself and Morgan. We were already working with them on a project and we be became the research and evaluation partners. And then Kaboom had a relationship with Jess and OpenStreetMap. Um, and so that's how we all got connected here. And so what we what we were focusing on was mapping the access and the quality of public play spaces in these three Colorado communities. And we focus both on access and quality. Access is pretty well defined and pretty well mapped. You'll see there's some limitations because it, we know where a lot of play spaces are, but there's very little information on the actual quality of those play spaces. Next slide. And so, as you all know, you know, given your backgrounds um, as as mappers, um, that that data is knowledge, and we were trying through this project to fill in some of these gaps. And so, you know, there's all sorts of gaps in data availability related to quality, and some related to access. <clears throat> And specifically, we worked with one urban and two rural counties in Colorado, and we began this project by reaching out to all of the local, um, you know, perhaps the person in the Department of Transportation or city planning or even parks and recreation at the county level or city levels across these three communities and just asking if, if they had shape files or layers uh, of parks and play spaces. And these are two quotes from those conversations in two different rural communities in Colorado. So one just, you know, emailed back, I do not know uh, anyone who tracks and map that sort of information in this part of the state. Most counties here do not have the resources to devote to projects like that. And then the second one, we do not have very much zoned uh, as open space or recreational use. So they had, you know, a zoning map, but not much was uh, zoned or allocated for open space or recreation use. 
And I do not know of a GIS map overlay that would give you this information. And so we were running into not having very good access uh, data, especially in rural Colorado, before we could even begin to think about the quality of these play spaces. Next slide. So working together with Kaboom and Jess um, at OpenStreetMap, we, we arrived at these three um, objectives. So the first was to assess the availability and usability of existing play space related data sets. Simply, we, we wanted a map of all the playgrounds that were publicly available in these three areas of Colorado. And then second, we wanted um, a systematic play space mapping effort to integrate multiple data sources. So we wanted not just where they were, we wanted the quality of these play spaces and what was available there. And then third, uh, it, and this is, you know, we then began working with you all as mappers and open streets and open street map. Um, and then third, an objective for tonight's conversation is to think through some of the strengths and challenges that we see from our side in applying an OpenStreetMap project over the past years to support this place based mapping. And honestly, it's there that I thought that, you know, some of my colleagues, Diane at, at National Recreation and Park Association, Russ at PlayCore, uh, Jay, the uh, PhD student looking at green gentrification in Miami. Um, you know, I, I think it's there that um, I think you'll find some really interesting overlaps between, between these kind of two different worlds of play-centric researchers and um, OpenStreetMap mappers. Um, next slide, please. And then we'll get to the comments. Um, before I hand it off to Jing, and Jing's going to really get into the details of what we did, these are our three areas in Colorado. Um, so to the right, that's not a full map of Colorado. I'm sure most of you will realize that quickly. Um, but up by Denver was our urban area. Um, it's called the East Colfax Corridor. It's really the area between Denver and Aurora. Um, there we had 24 census tracts, and that's what the call-out map is. And then we worked in Rio Grande and Otero counties, um, both in the south and kind of southeast of Colorado. And these are very rural counties with populations like in the, I want to say 20,000 to 40,000 people in, across the entire county. Uh, and so these were our three areas. These areas were chosen by the Colorado Health Foundation. Um, prior to us coming into the project, they were chosen as very low income areas in areas primarily made up of residents from um, minority uh, race and ethnicity populations. And so these were our three areas. I do want to check out the comments really quick. Um, so Steve said, many states have not all have public area databases for things like state parks, open spaces, et cetera. I, I agree. I mean, we we're pretty good with national parks and state parks and larger city parks what really we ran into were these like the rural cities where a city is 2000 people and there's not fantastic maps or fantastic layers. And if there are, it's a layer that says this is a park and we have no idea if that park has a playground, a swing, a slide, something for a kid, which was the focus of the Colorado Health Foundation. They may have, they may have a trail, they may have a soccer pitch, um, but that information, that metadata is usually not in these files. And, and you know, perhaps I'm wrong with some of the public area databases, but we have really struggled to find that. And then we wanted this to be open to all publicly available play spaces. And so we did purposely include schools because a lot of areas have um, what's referred to as shared use. So a school's playground would be open to the public as a playground after hours on the weekend and during summer break. Um, and public housing, some areas and specifically Aurora, uh, their public housing play spaces are meant to be open to the broader community, not just to those living in the houses uh, there. We did not seek private play spaces here and you'll see a lot of private play spaces crept into our data sets. Um, yep. Cool. All right, Jing, I think it's uh, I think it's you. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Oh, yeah, I think those questions help us to make a good transition here. So first, I'm going to talk about what our findings from collecting the existing data sets is what's available 
out there that we can use to develop this place-based data set. Um, so we, we found that there um, um, data sets uh, at different geographic levels across these three uh, study areas. And um, however, very few data sets are um, directly related to play, play spaces. Um, here we mean a playgrounds, um, the, the play spaces that consist of multiple playgrounds, for example. Um, so like, for example, um, one uh, data set that document playgrounds from Trust for Public Land. It's a nonprofit organization that create parks for and pr protected land for people. Um, they do have a playground data set, but the number of playgrounds were very few and only like 20 uh, playgrounds across our study regions. So that's very limited number. We think there, there should be more. And we also find uh, a, a playground data set that's uh, by the city of Denver, but that's limited to only the, the city of Denver uh, region. Um, of course, we find a lot of data sets uh, like, um, you mentioned before, um, so that's the schools, public housing, parks across the geographical regions. Um, those may not be, yes, they are not directly related to play spaces, not, not telling us where exactly the playgrounds are, but they can kind of point out the location where there might potentially be playgrounds. Uh, so, and we also find this pattern that this, the availability of this data set varies by the degree of urbanization. And that means that um, there are more data sets available in the urban area, like the East Colfax, and fewer data sets in the rural counties, which makes sense because um, the rural counties usually have limited resources to collect data and create the GIS layers. Um, so given the fact that there won't, they won't many data sets available, um, so we collaborated with OpenStreetMap um, uh, in the winter last year. Um, so Jess helped us to um, set up this project to recruit uh, OpenStreetMap volunteers to help us map playgrounds, sports facilities, and amenities. Um, so, but here we are going to talk about playgrounds only because that's the current focus of our project. And during this mapping um, process uh, by the OpenStreetMap, they also um, complete uh, a validation uh, to, to make sure the quality of these mapping efforts. So um, many thanks to the OpenStreetMap volunteers. Um, there were a lot of play space, playgrounds were mapped through these projects. Um, to 335 playgrounds identified in East Colfax Corridor, 39 playgrounds in Otero County, 40 playgrounds in Rio Grande County. So after we got this data set, um, can I can I just sorry like yeah. we go back what just I, I do want to to bring that home like through this process um, and through the you know six or seven of you on on the call and, and obviously some other volunteers, but you know, over 300 play spaces were mapped and they were mapped quite quickly from my, you know, from, from my standard, especially the ones around East Colfax. It did take a little time um, in, in some of the rural areas, um, but these were, these 300 playgrounds uh, were mapped very quickly. So thanks, Jean. Um, So after we got the data, um, our team um, went through uh, a few steps to further validate the data set. Uh, the purpose is to ensure um, we have a comprehensive data set, place-based data set. So first, um, they start with cleaning the data sets from OpenStreetMap and followed by the first validation, which is a um, cross-examining um, the OpenStreetMap data set with existing data sets. Also, the uh, inputs from the community members. Um, and then um, we also do some ground truth work by um, some outside assessment to understand, to investigate whether these playgrounds identified were are accessible and uh, whether they exist 
and the um, how they were used um, on site. So this is the validated results. Um, so um, overall, we think OpenStreetMap Map volunteers did a really good job, and but we only find very minor errors in the data. Some examples like um, so just a few like around five to ten percent of the playgrounds that were identified actually not exist. Uh, that's the very minor issue here. And then compare that with the existing data set and the uh, input from the community members or the uh, staff from the local governments. We found there a few playgrounds were not mapped by the OpenStreetMap efforts. So overall, by looking at the percentage of the play validated playgrounds that were mapped by OpenStreetMap, we can see that the accuracy rate were pretty high. It's ranged from 82% to 96% across these three study areas. This is just an example to show you um, um, what um, like a playgrounds that uh, uh, did not identify um, through the OpenStreetMap effort. Um, so this is a pop. Um, this is a public housing community uh, in Otero County, and one of the playgrounds were identified was identified through the a project, and um, another one is not, and which was identified from the our um, on-site assessment contractors. Um, so we found that there might be a few um, reasons that leads leads to this error is um, the availability of the uh, satellite image. I mean, I would say resolution of the satellite image. It's um, not easy to tell what this is um, just from the satellite image. And uh, there's another way to do that is to look at the street view. And through the street view, we are able to see a, a picture like this. So you can tell like there's a playground over here on the right side of the, the community. But these um, playgrounds cannot actually be seen uh, through the street view because it's blocked by these buildings. So after validate the, the number of playgrounds, um, we 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 then looking at the um, the local information of these playgrounds as we we found that most of the playgrounds uh, mapped by OpenStreetMap um, did not have any uh, street level information associated with them, and uh, which will make it difficult for um, our on site assessment work as well as for that be used uh, for, for the practitioner or the community to use. Um, so we, we then um, looking at, we then verified information, especially focused on the street level information, such as what are the types of the play spaces, uh, playgrounds, where are these playgrounds, what are the names of these place, uh, places, and what are the addresses? And those are the information that people can use when they don't really have any GIS tools um, on hand. Um, so this is just a general idea for you to know that the play space type um, of these playgrounds, and we found that the playgrounds uh, not only are in parks, uh, a lot of them are actually in schools and part of are in the church, childcare, private housing and public housing. So it can be from different, it can be located in different type of places. places. Um, so after validate the data and uh, verify the local information, we then um, work on the um, assess the usability, accessibility, and quality of these playgrounds. Um, so first, what we did here is, is to uh, through the onsite assessment, we look at how those playgrounds were used, um, and to try to identify the play space is where each playground or several playground can be used as a what as a whole. So here take this uh, playground, this school, for example, there are seven playgrounds uh, mapped um, by OpenStreetMap. 
but we found um, based on our own site assessment, we saw these two actually can be considered as one play space uh, because usually it's used as a whole uh, entire um, um, one play, one space for the for children. And then we're looking at whether these play playgrounds um, are accessible, are open to the public. And surprisingly, we found that um, a lot of the playgrounds were not um, open to the public because we see a lot of the no trespassing sign um, outside of the playgrounds. So in across these three study areas, um, in East Colfax corridor, around 40, um, sorry, 52 percent of the playgrounds, um, only 52 percent were accessible to the public, and in the rural county areas, around um, 50, um, 82 to 85 percent of the playgrounds were accessible to the public. Um, there are several reasons. Just um, part of the playgrounds were located in private school or churches. A private Private, uh, private housing. And there are very many reasons that they don't really open these playgrounds to the public. Um, and can then- I, uh, Jean, can I provide a little other context on that previous slide as well? And this is course. kind of to the question. So, so right. So I mean, we lost almost half of the play spaces that were mapped by OpenStreetMap because once we were on the ground and trying to access them some a little beforehand when we were and, and jingle get into how we were verifying some of the addresses um but we like there were about half of the play spaces that we ended up um, not being able to evaluate for for the quality but in addition to private schools and churches and private housing one of the interesting things was um public schools in aurora and denver are supposed to have their play spaces open to the public um, but I'm pretty sure this photo is from a public school. And so they have they have these signs that are meant to allow the school to not allow people in if they see fit. Um, but the spaces are supposed to be open to the public afterwards. So it was really confusing. Um, we walked into a lot of schools and would ask even when we saw these signs. And some schools would say, yes, we are open. We just have the signs out there. Some would say, no, our play spaces are never open to the public. Um, and the only thing that was consistent were charter schools and charter schools are technically public, um, but the charter schools never had their play spaces open. And so it was it was like, you couldn't just use the, the county policy. You had to literally walk into every elementary school and speak to somebody. And I'm convinced what we were told when we walked in depended on who we talked to that day that if it were the principal or an admin assistant, there could have been two different answers um, based on their understanding or reading of the policy. So thanks, Jean. Okay. Um, so we also looking at the quality of these place spaces. Um, and we have a um, quality assessment tool that help us to uh, help us validate help us evaluate the quality of these um, plague structures based on the physical condition, such as um, whether, um, where, whether there are any parts are broken, and also based on the play value here. Uh, for example, whether this uh, play structure, whether the design encourage uh, physical activity. Um, so, um, so overall, we see that actually uh, the quality score, the overall quality score differ by playgrounds as well as differ across these three study regions. Mm -hmm. So here are some takeaways. Um, based on our mapping work and the validations and the quality assessment, um, so our we found on average, um, OpenStreetMap um, has really high accuracy rates um, across the three study areas. And we really appreciate uh, the volunteers' help um, to help um, map the play spaces in our study regions. And second, we want to highlight here is that um, we, we found that accuracy rates are slightly lower in rural counties. 
um, which is um, a little bit surprising. Um, however, this might can be um, um, because by uh, the fact that they were not um, good access to high resolution um, street level image. Uh, such as the street view data uh, are limited in the rural counties. Um, so um, another um, another thing we want to highlight here is that um, so only uh, looking at the number of playgrounds is not enough. Is not enough. Um, further looking at whether it's usable and the quality of these playgrounds. Um, will provide more um, insights and that can help with the decision making that help to end the gaps in the access to these uh, play spaces. And the last one I want to talk about here is that actually we were surprised by how many how much work we put into um, creating street level geography for every single playground that were mapped. Um, that th the thing is uh, to to look at each playground polygon and then find where ex exactly these playgrounds are are a little bit challenging sometimes when the the space the places were not tagged on the Google Map for example so then we we need to figure out a way either Google or uh, zoom in to look at the street view to see if there are any sign tell us where exactly where exactly that playground is. So um, more work is needed to uh, improve this um, street level geography information so that this data set can be applicable to local communities. Uh, so at this point, we have introduced how the place based data set have been developed. So I think most of you may be interested in what are we are going to do with this this data set? So this is the work that we have been we are currently working on um, is to use this data to further investigate the inequality inequity issues um, across the communities um, in terms of the access to quality play spaces. So our step here, um, there are um, two steps in general. Uh, the first thing we do here is to develop. Um, play space access indica indicators um, in order to help us to understand um, whether um, each community neighborhoods across the study areas have the same um, level of access to quality play spaces. Um, the map on the left shows you the proximity um, of the Proximity to uh, proximity of the play spaces across the census tract in East Colfax Corridor, for example. So this is uh, we we first create a buffer of these playgrounds that were located in East Colfax Corridor, and that's a half mile buffer. And then we calculate the percentage of the area within this buffer per census tract. And the value you see here is a standardized score. So you can see the higher value, the positive value, meaning um, has um, the proximity that's above the average and vice versa. So in general, you can see through this, across these census tracts, uh, most of the uh, census tracts uh, have pretty good uh, proximity, have proximity to playgrounds. So they have access to at least one playground um, per census track across this um, census track in a dark green. And on the right side is looking at another aspect of the access that's counting the number of play spaces available per census tract. It's also a z-score. So the, the positive value here, the darker blue, meaning um, that so on average, um, so this census tract has more um, play spaces um, than um, above the average value. So we can compare these two map, we can find something really interesting is that even though most of the sense track has um, proximity, um, in, is in proximity to play spaces. Um, however, a few census track that 
um, have less, have fewer um, access to, um, have access to fewer playgrounds compared to other census tracts. And then we also create a map of the quality uh, indicators. So here you can see that's the quality score based on the play value and the physical condition of these play spaces. And uh, the darker means the, the higher quality score, uh, lower is the lower uh, quality score across the census tract. It's also a standardized Z score. So further compare the um, access indicator and the quality, we can also see something interesting here is that um, although some sense tracks has um, good access to play spaces, like the one I highlighted here. Um, however, the quality of these play spaces in this sense track is not that, are not that good. It's not that good. And you can see another sense track around the bottom uh, right side of this map um, has poor uh, access to play spaces. However, um, these uh, very few playgrounds here actually has really good quality. So our the next step um, is to looking at uh, whether there's a, there are gap um, in the access to quality play spaces across the communities. And uh, to do that, we're looking at the associations between um, access or uh, we say quality indicators and some social inequality, in, excuse me, inequity indicators. So here um, is an example where we're looking at the association between the place-based quality and the socioeconomic status per census tract. So by looking at the association, we are able to identify the census tract um, that are most, most disadvantaged in terms of access to quality play spaces. So in this high, this census highlight in dark red are the uh, neighborhoods where um, the residents um, have lower socioeconomic status and they also have um, their access, uh, they, their access to, I mean, the the play spaces in the in their neighborhoods ha has relatively lower quality compared to other census tracts. And we also identify two census tracts that are the um, can be we will say the most advantaged neighborhoods where we can see um, the residents have higher socioeconomic status compared to other census tract. Then th they also have um, access to high quality play spaces. So we are still working on this and um, hopefully we can have the findings published in the uh, beginning of next year. Um, this is the end of our presentation. So uh, we are open to any question and comments. And um, thank you very much.